Hello. Welcome to Living Hope Church Online. Brought to you by Living Hope Church Broadcast Media. I am your host, Pastor Dr. Kemi Atanda Ilori, the General Overseer of Living Hope Church. Today, Sunday, the 7th of May, 2023, I am grateful to God that we can continue our series on waiting for God. Waiting for God. Come with me to the Psalms, chapter 40, verses 1 to 3. Psalms 40, verses 1 to 3. I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined to me. He heard my cry. He also brought me up out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock, and established my steps. He has put a new song in my mouth, praise to our God. Many will see it and fear, and will trust in the Lord. The psalmist makes it clear that waiting patiently for God is always rewarding. It has many benefits. The psalmist tells us he waited patiently for the Lord and God answered his prayers. So we know very clearly that waiting for God is very beneficial. Waiting for God is very beneficial. However, we are human. And because we are human, on many occasions, we actually struggle about waiting for God. We struggle with waiting for God. We find it very difficult. Today, I want to look at the question, what can make us fail to wait patiently for God? What can make us fail to wait patiently for God? The answer is straightforward. We all face moments where our patience diminishes, where our patience wears thin, either with other people or with ourselves, or to be honest with God's plan for our life. According to the Bible, we know very clearly that patience is one of the fruit of the Holy Spirit. It's a sign that we trust in God. If we are born again, if we have given our life to Jesus Christ, if indeed the Holy Spirit is dwelling in our life, one of the fruit of the Holy Spirit is patience. Like every fruit, we need to produce patience in abundance. Day by day, as we walk with God, as we face different situations in our life, we begin to learn how to produce the fruit of patience by the power of the Holy Spirit who is operating in our life. You see, the Bible shows us very clearly that lack of patience can cause us to miss God's blessings. Remember Esau, the twin brother of Jacob. He lost his birthright because he couldn't wait patiently to satisfy his hunger. He was so hungry and he was so desperate to be fed that he traded his birthright with his twin brother Jacob. Lack of patience made him to miss 
all the benefits associated with him being the firstborn of his parents. You'll see this story in Genesis chapter 25 from verse 29 to 34. Another person that we can remember is Achan, who perished with his family because he could not wait for the appropriate time to be rewarded by God. He stole some spoils from war. He stole some Babylonian garments and some gems because he couldn't wait to be appropriately rewarded for his service. He perished along with his family due to lack of patience. You see the story in Joshua chapter 7, verses 20 to 24. Another person that we should remember when we are looking at the vital part that patience plays in our relationship with God is Geasai. Geasai is the student or the apprentice of the prophet Elisha. When prophet Elisha, through the power of God, had healed Naaman, the Syrian commander, from Naaman's leprosy, the prophet Elisha told Naaman to go back to Syria. Naaman offered all sorts of gifts, but the prophet Elisha refused to take a penny from Naaman. Gehazi, the servant of the prophet Elisha, was not happy that his master did not receive any payment for healing Naaman. So behind his master, he ran and pursued Naaman, the Syrian commander, and he obtained certain gifts from him. When he came back, through the Holy Spirit, the prophet Elisha confronted him about his action. To cut a long story short, because of his impatience, Gehazi lost out, and the leprosy of Naaman returned to Gehazi. He became leprous. Why? Because he couldn't wait for the appropriate time to be rewarded for his services in the kingdom of God. A lot of people are like that as well. Maybe they are general overseers. Maybe they are bishops. Maybe they are prophets. Maybe they are pastors. Maybe they are ministers. Maybe they are just members of the local church. When somebody is not waiting for God to be rewarded at the appropriate time by God, they will do whatever they could do to become rich, to become famous, to become great in the sight of men. And out of their impatience, the judgment of God will eventually fall upon them. If not in this life, then in the life to come, when Jesus will say to them, depart from me, you workers of iniquity, workers of lawlessness, I never knew you. May that not be the voice of Jesus to us on the last day. So you can see being patient is a vital part of our relationship with God. It's an important part of trusting in God. Because as you know, our life circumstances can be far different from the ideal that we are praying for or the ideal that we are expecting from God. All of us, whether we like it or not, there will be occasions in our life when we might look at our life and think where we are, what we have, is actually not as good as we were expecting from God 
or as we had worked for in life. We might feel unfortunate. We might feel unlucky. And if we had the chance to do something with our own hands without waiting for God, because our circumstances are different from what we would prefer, then it's possible for us to show impatience and to go ahead, cut corners, do something that God doesn't want us to do, or do something that God says it is not yet time for us to do, and we get into trouble with God. And we miss out significantly on the benefits of waiting patiently for God. There are many well-known Bible verses that teach us the importance of patience and that we should always be thankful to God for what we have currently and for where we are currently in our journey with God, regardless of what we are facing right now. There are also plenty of scriptures about how we must love others and be patient with people in our relationships. Thank God for his Holy Spirit in us. Although we are still human, but when we yield our life to the Holy Spirit day by day, guess what? We get better and better in pleasing the Lord rather than pleasing ourselves. Guess what? We begin to increase in the fruit of patience, which is a fruit that the Holy Spirit produces in our life as we walk with God day by day. Waiting for God can make us to gain strength in a time of weakness. We can turn to God for strength to wait on his timing and plan for our life. We can do that. That's why today's message, today's broadcast, is going to help me. It's going to help you in waiting for God. So let's ask the question again. What can make us fail to wait patiently for God? Come with me to 1 Samuel, chapter 13, verses 1 to 14. 1 Samuel, chapter 13, verses 1 to 14. Saul reigned one year, and when he had reigned two years over Israel, Saul chose for himself 3,000 men of Israel. 2,000 were with Saul in Michmash and in the mountains of Bethel and a thousand were with Jonathan in Gibeah of Benjamin. The rest of the people Saul sent away, every man to his tent. Verse 3, And Jonathan attacked the garrison of the Philistines that was in Gibeah, and the Philistines heard of it. Then Saul blew the trumpet throughout all the land, saying, Let the Hebrews hear. Now all Israel had it. They had it said that Saul had attacked the garrison of the Philistines and that Israel had also become an abomination to the Philistines. And the people were called together to Saul at Gilgal. Then the Philistines gathered together to fight with Israel. 30,000 chariots and 6,000 horsemen and people as the sand which is on the seashore in multitude. And they came up and then camped in Michmash to the east of Beth Avon. When the men of Israel saw that they were in danger for the people were distressed, then the people hid in caves, in bushes, in rocks, in holes, and in pits. And some of the Hebrews even crossed over the Jordan to the land of Gad 
and Gilead. As for Saul, he was still in Gilgal, and all the people followed him, trembling. Then Saul waited seven days, according to the time set by Samuel. But Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and the people were scattered from Saul. So Saul said, Bring a burnt offering and peace offerings here to me. And he offered the burnt offering. Verse 10, Now it happened, as soon as he had finished presenting the burnt offering, that Samuel came, and Saul went out to meet him, that he might greet Samuel. But Samuel said to Saul, What have you done? Saul said, When I saw that the people were scattering from me, and that you did not come within the days appointed, and that the Philistines gathered together at Michmash, then I said, Ah, the Philistines will now come down on me at Gilgal, and have not made supplication to the Lord. Therefore, I felt compelled and offered a burnt offering. And Samuel said to Saul, You have done foolishly. You have not kept the commandment of the Lord your God, which he commanded you. For now the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. But now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought for himself a man after his own heart. And the Lord has commanded him to be commander over his people because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. In that story, we can see the impatience of Saul. But what started it off is actually the impatience of Jonathan, the son of Saul. Clearly, the prophet Samuel had told Saul to wait for seven days so that Samuel would come, and as the priest appointed by God, he would offer sacrifices as a petition to God to intervene on their behalf, on behalf of Israel against the Philistines. You look at the story again. The Philistines had so many chariots, Israel had none. The Philistines had many horsemen, Israel had none. In terms of population, in terms of the number of soldiers, the Philistines had many, many more soldiers than Israel had. So, if you look at it, the battle was uneven against Israel. There is unequal power, imbalance of power, Weapons of war, the Philistines had much more than Israel. There is no doubt that if Israel was going to win at all, it would be a miracle. It would be through the divine intervention of God. So Samuel had told Saul, wait seven days. Let me come before you start the war. But you see what Jonathan did. Before the seven days, Jonathan struck the Philistines. And the Philistines were, why did you slap us so badly? We are going to attack you now. Because of the impatience of Jonathan, something happened that made the situation worse for the whole of Israel. The impatience of Jonathan led to the Philistines rapidly advancing against Israel, against Saul. Can you see how the impatience of his son also caused him to lose sleep? Immediately, Saul became a man who needed to act as quickly as possible in order to forestall the Philistines, in order to stop the Philistines from gaining the upper hand. So he waited and waited, and when Samuel had not shown up, he decided to act in place of Samuel by offering 
supplication to God, supplication that only the priest, the approved priest, was supposed to make. See, as soon as he had finished making the offering, the burnt offering, Samuel arrived. You see, the seven days had not gone. On the seventh day, Saul waited until breakfast time. Samuel did not show up. Lunch time, Samuel did not show up. Supper time, Samuel did not show up. But it wasn't midnight yet. So though he waited seven days, he did not wait until Samuel would arrive on the seventh day. The impatience of his son, Jonathan, caused an uproar in the camp of the Philistines. The Philistines' threat increased massively and made Saul, the father of Jonathan, impatient as well. We have to be careful. If your husband is impatient, be careful that it doesn't lead you to become impatient too. Remember, what the Lord is teaching us today. Don't let the impatience of someone close to you or someone that you trust or someone that you love cause you to be impatient as well. If your wife is impatient, don't let it cause you impatience. Some wife might be impatient telling their husband, you too can become a pastor. Go on, get it. Or it is the pastor or the husband who might be impatient and be pushing the wife for a bigger position in church, a bigger position at work, a bigger position in the family. Be careful. Don't let the impatience of someone that you know, someone that you love, cause you to be impatient as well. Remember how it happened to Abraham and Sarah. Having waited 10 years and the promise of God was yet to be fulfilled, Sarah said to her husband, you can have my maid servant, Agar. You can go in to Agar and Agar might bear a child for us. And of course it happened and Agar bore a son that Abraham named Ishmael. You know the story. You know how that nearly destroyed the marriage of Abraham and Sarah and nearly caused them to lose the blessing of God. Be careful. Don't let someone else's impatience make you become impatient as well. Lack of patience is often a great sign that your trust in God is shaky that your faith in God is shaky. May God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit show you when to stand firm even when others are impatient. When your children come to you asking you to do something for them that you know this is a sign of impatience on their part, stand firm. Don't let their impatience drag you down in the sight of God. May God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit help each one of us to understand that we are vulnerable. We are vulnerable to the impatience of those who are close to us, those that we love, those that we respect, those that are sometimes in authority over us. Be careful. Today we are looking at what are the things that can make us fail to patiently wait for God? What can make us fail to wait patiently for God? And the first one is the impatience of others. Let's move on. The second one, we will find the story in Psalm 37, verses 1 to 11. Psalm 37 verses 1 to 11. Do not fret because of evildoers, nor be envious of the workers of iniquity, 
for they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring your desire to pass. God shall bring forth your righteousness as the light, and your justice as the noonday. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret because of him who prospers in his way, because of the man who brings wicked schemes to pass. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret. It only causes harm. For evildoers shall be cut off. For those who wait on the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. For yet a little while, and the wicked shall be no more. Indeed, you will look carefully for his place, but it shall be no more. But the meek shall inherit the earth, and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. Amen. 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 So you can see how the Bible is teaching us some of the factors that can make us fail to patiently wait for God. In Psalm 37 that we have just read, verses 1 to 11, you can plainly see that God is showing us that the success of the unrighteous and the wicked can make us to become impatient with ourselves can make us to become impatient with others can make us to become impatient with God. So the Bible can genuinely see that when we are doing our best to please God and things are not working exactly the way we want and we see other people, they don't go to church they don't pray. They don't believe in Jesus. They don't trust in God. In fact, sometimes the reason why they succeed is that they do funny things. They do sinful things. They do wicked things. They do fraud. They deceive others. They walk in a cunning way and they seem to be making it whilst we who are trusting in God, doing what is right in his sight, being peacemakers rather than fighting people, being cooperative rather than being antagonistic, walking with other people in a way that promotes peace, and unity and cohesion at work, in our family, in our community, in our church. We see that despite all of that that we do, which is right in the sight of God, we are not exactly getting the results that we are looking for. We are not getting the outcomes that we have prayed for. It's taking longer than we expect for God to intervene for us. It seems we have been left behind and those who don't trust God, those who don't believe in God, those who don't seek to please God, they appear to be prospering and succeeding. And it's like they are looking at us and saying, okay, What's the advantage of you who claim to know God, who claim to love God, who claim that you are serving God? What is your advantage? So Psalm 37 says, when things like that happen, we are going to be fretting. We are going to be complaining. We are going to feel frustrated. 
we are going to feel envious. We are going to feel jealous. We are going to feel disappointed by God. We are going to come to the conclusion that, hmm, haven't you heard that heaven helps those who help themselves? So we're going to start thinking, whatever we do can do, whether it pleases God or not, just get on with your life. Just do whatever you can do, whether it pleases God or not. What is the result of keeping God's commandments? What is the result of trying to please God? When it is taking such a long time, when your life appears to be standstill, when your life is not improving in any way, I hope someone today, I hope the word of God is reaching you because it is reaching me. One reason why we fail to patiently wait for God is when we see that the unrighteous and the wicked are becoming more and more successful and we compare our own life with their life and we feel that God has not been exactly faithful to us. May God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit help us when that feeling comes. Because see what the Bible says, those who do wickedly, those who do fraudulently, those who walk deception in order to get ahead, those who don't trust in God, it's not going to last. Often they don't even have peace of mind anyway. Not everything that glitters is gold. May God give us the grace to understand that waiting for God, no matter how long it takes, is far more beneficial than trying to go and do some funny things, do some deceptive things, do some sinful things in order to get ahead in life. Waiting for God pays. So you can see it in verse 3, Psalm 37. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. Don't let the success and the prosperity of the wicked and the unrighteous make you to stop waiting patiently for God. Delight yourself also in the Lord. Especially if you're already doing so, don't stop it. God will eventually reward each one of us. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you your heart's desire. Eventually, it will happen. It will happen at a time that you don't expect, in a way that you don't expect. But be sure of this. It will happen. Waiting for God pays. Waiting for God pays. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. Commit your way. Don't get tired. I'm speaking to myself here. I hope I'm speaking to you too. Those of us who genuinely love the Lord, those of us who are genuinely serving the Lord, those of us who selflessly love people, there are times when we look around and we shake our heads in disbelief when we see other people prospering. And we ourselves, we seem to be stagnant. We seem not to have what we really badly desire. At such times, it's possible to stop being good, being kind, asking, what is the purpose? It is pointless. But the Bible says, commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him at such times, and he shall bring it to pass. 
I'm grateful to God that in his mercy, I've seen this in my own life, that God has brought it to pass and given me my heart's desire. At the right time, in the right way, for the right purpose. So, that is another reason why we may find it difficult to wait for God, why we might fail to patiently wait for God when we are envious and jealous, when we are complaining and disappointed that those who don't pray, those who don't trust the Lord, those who don't walk what is right in the sight of God, whether in our family or in our church or in our community or in our workplaces, they seem to be people who are making it in life, people who are becoming managers and leaders, people who are in authority in our country, wicked people. But God is saying to us, be patient. Don't set your standard by their standard. Set your standard by God still. And understand that no matter how long it takes, God will give you the desires of your heart. We have to move on. Third point. We are going to read Luke chapter 15, verses 11 to 24. Luke chapter 15, verses 11 to 24. Let's read it together. This is a parable that Jesus told his disciples. Then Jesus said, A certain man had two sons. This is the parable of the prodigal son, or the parable of the lost son. A certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, Give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So the father divided to them his livelihood. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there he wasted his possessions with prodigal living, with wasteful living. That's why the son is called the prodigal son or the wasteful son. But when he had spent all, something that he had not bargained for happened. When he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in that land, a severe drought. The economy failed, the money failed, the markets failed, and he began to suffer want and he came into poverty. As a result, the prodigal son went and joined himself to a citizen of that country. He thought to himself, the best thing for me to do now is to go and work for someone else who was already a citizen in the country that the prodigal son was living in. And the gentleman sent him to his feeds to his fields to feed swine. So he got a job as somebody who will be looking after pigs. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the food that was given to the pigs, but no one gave him anything. Therefore, on a certain day, it occurred to him that he was living the life that was not designed for him by his father. He came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against you, I've sinned against heaven and before you, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he arose, and he went to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion, and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to his father, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. 
But the father said to his servants, Bring out the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet, and bring the fatted calf here and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to be merry. This story, this parable, is about all of us. We all sinned in Adam. We forfeited through the sin of Adam. We forfeited our relationship with God. The life that was designed by God for us in the Garden of Eden, a spiritual life, a spiritual life that is combined with material prosperity, we forfeited it when Adam sinned. But it wasn't just Adam that sinned. Now that sin was in the world, we also have sinned personally against God. So that story is telling us that anytime we are in sin, anytime we are not reconciled with God, then our life is not the ideal that God planned for us. But thank God, through Christ Jesus, the Lord opens our hearts to repent and to become saved by putting our faith on the finished sacrifice that Jesus did on the cross when he endured suffering and pain and mockery and grief. When he died on the cross, he shed his blood on the cross for each one of us. For Jesus says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever would put their faith in him, they would be saved. They would have eternal life. So the parable of the prodigal son is to let us know that when we repent, God is more than happy to have us back. But the most important bridge between us and God is the Lord Jesus Christ. It is because of his righteousness that God is happy to have us back. But you see, in connection with the topic we are dealing with today, what can make us fail to patiently wait for God? You can see that this young man, instead of waiting patiently for his father to divide the portion of his inheritance to him, at the right time, the young man thought to himself that he knew it all, that he was ready to manage his own resources. He thought to himself that he was ready. What does that show you? Pride. What does that show you? Selfishness. He wasn't going to care about his father. He was thinking more about himself. Selfishness. So you see pride, overconfidence. Instead of waiting patiently for the father to say, this is the time, my son. I can see you gained maturity. You've gained enough experience. You can handle this issue. No. Pride filled him up. I can do it right now. I can do it better than my father. I can manage my resources now. Some people, they will want to become pastor or minister or general overseer or whatever, even in their family, even at work, even in the community. Instead of waiting patiently for the right time, for God to do what? To promote them in their family in their community, at work. They will be full of themselves. They will be arrogant. They will be oity-toity. And I've seen that in church as well. Sometimes, as we all know, it is the empty drum that makes the loudest noise. The empty drum makes the loudest noise. 
before you know it, you see in church people that should keep quiet. They're the one who speaks so much and they are speaking nonsense. They want everybody to know that they already are filled with power and with all kinds of things that they think people should know about. Meanwhile, they are just filled with pride. And pride comes before what? Pride comes before destruction. They are overconfident. They know next to nothing, but they think they know everything. They miscalculate. Before you promote them, they've already promoted themselves. Look at a person like Absalom, the son of David. He promoted himself. He felt he was better than his father. He even went on to sacrifice to God. But you know what came upon him? Impatience killed him. He fought against his father. His father had to leave Jerusalem and he pursued his father to kill him so that he could have the throne. That was Absalom. He didn't wait for the time that his father would say, here is the throne, you can have it. Pride, overconfidence, selfishness, wickedness made him lose patience. I'm praying for all of us. May God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, help us to overcome pride. Sometimes when we are talking about pride, some people will say, I thank God I am not proud. And immediately I know that they are filled with pride. Immediately I know that they are filled with pride. We have to humble ourselves genuinely before God. We have to take our hearts to the Lord. We have to humbly submit to God. When we are filled with pride, guess what? We are like an empty drum that is making a loud noise. That was the prodigal son. He miscalculated. He took everything that his father could give him. He went away and he lavished it. He wasted it. He didn't factor in that there will be a drought. When the drought came, he had no answer to deal with it. No answer. He miscalculated. I've seen that in church. I've seen that in the family. I've seen that at work. So that is another factor that might make us to fail to wait patiently for God. We have to finish. Time is far gone. So you see the self-deception. You see the pride. You see the presumptuousness. You see the miscalculation of the prodigal son. Let's finish. Point number four. Suffering and lack of knowledge of God's will in our suffering can make us fail to patiently wait for God. When we are suffering, when we are suffering injustice, when somebody is very harsh to us, maybe our auntie, maybe our uncle, maybe our parents, maybe our husband, maybe our wife, maybe our employers, maybe our neighbors, when they become harsh towards us, when they are hostile against us for no good reason, when we are suffering, when we are suffering injustice, when we are suffering unfair treatment, we are going to ask ourselves, how long are we going to suffer for whilst waiting for God to get us justice, to intervene for us? to help defeat the enemy. Especially when we know that the unfair treatment, we can't stop it ourselves. There are times like that, that the unfair treatment, the harshness, the hostility, the enmity that people have against us, the malice, that there is nothing we can do to stop it. 
Even if you cut off your head to please your enemy, it still doesn't please them. So you are waiting for God. You are praying, oh God, save me. Oh God, get me justice. Suffering can make us feel that enough is enough. We must take action in our own hands. We must take matters in our own hands. Suffering is painful. Think about it this way. What about illnesses? You might be unwell. It might be that your illness causes you so much pain, so much grief. It might be your child. It might be your husband, your wife, your spouse. It might be a member of your family that you love. It might be your mom or your dad. When you see them in pain and you are praying for them, or it might be your very good self. You are going through pain and you are praying. The medications are not working. The prayer seems not to be working. Come on, we are all human. It's possible for us to stop waiting for God, to come to a place where we just say, okay, God doesn't care about us. And we start complaining. We become bitter. We feel offended by God. I know what I'm talking about. I have been there. I have been there. So you see, suffering can cause us to fail to wait patiently for God. Romans chapter 8, verses 18 to 25. Romans chapter 8, verses 18 to 25. Let's go and read it. Romans 8, 18 to 25. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the annexed expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the old creation groans and labors with bad pangs together until now. Not only that, but we also, who have the first fruits of the Holy Spirit, even we ourselves, we groan, we groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. For we were saved in this hope. But hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? Verse 25, where we are stopping. But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with patience, with perseverance. Unless you have the right perspective about suffering, not just suffering in your own life, suffering in the life of the people you love, even suffering in the world at large, like wars in which innocent people are killed, or suffering in your country brought about by a government that doesn't care for its citizens. Leaders who steal funds, who steal money from their country and leave their country poor. Roads are not repaired. Roads are not looked after. Nobody is looked after. Poverty continues to increase. No new hospitals are built, no new schools are built. Even those that are in existence, they are not well looked after. People are suffering. When you look at that and you are a Christian, unless you have a perspective of God on suffering, you will be disappointed with God in your country, in your family, in your workplace, in your community. 
that's what the Bible is saying, that the suffering we are going through, unless we know that by the grace of God, God has something better for us. If God doesn't come to relieve us of our suffering on this earth, let us imagine that we die because of a particular illness. Let us imagine that the suffering doesn't end until we die. The Bible is saying, but there is a better place for us. You need to have a perspective on suffering in this world, that God is doing something that we do not know about, that we do not see, but God will not allow suffering to continue forever. And those of us who have placed our hope in God, remember what the Bible is saying here. Hope that you see is not hope. But why will you continue to hope for something that you already see? But if you do not see it, then you hope for it eagerly. You wait for it eagerly. So, for instance, if you are hoping that God will heal you, that you take your medications, you do everything that you need to do, but your illness is still there, you hope eagerly. You do not start to complain. You just say, Lord, whatever it is, I trust you will bring me through. Otherwise, you will start complaining. You won't be waiting for God again. The same thing, maybe financially you are suffering. You don't have the money. You don't have the finances to get you through life. You don't have the money to make your life comfortable. You are struggling to make ends meet. You are struggling to put food on your table. You are struggling about what will you wear? What will your children wear? Maybe that is the stage of your life now. Maybe that is the suffering that you have. But you see, you need to have a perspective of God on your suffering. First perspective, behind the scene, God is doing something about your suffering. Have you put your faith in God? Walk by faith, not by sight. I know sometimes it is easy to hear it, but it is very difficult to put it into practice. I know it because, like you, I have been in such terrible situations. But I can tell you, I waited patiently, and God inclined himself to me, and he brought me out of a horrible pit. He brought me out of a miry clay. It took long, but God did it. I really want to encourage you. Suffering is something that can make us Stop waiting for God. Suffering is something that will make people start looking out for sangomas, for dark powers, for dark forces, for witches and wizards. Suffering, financial suffering, suffering as a result of health. People stop waiting for God. They take, they take matters into their own hands. But I'm encouraging each one of us today no matter what type of suffering, the first perspective that we need is this. God is doing something about it. God is doing something about it. God knows about your suffering and it will come through for you. The second perspective that we need when we are suffering is to say to ourselves, we will never complain against God. I have been there. I have complained, but for the mercy of God. So if you ask me, what did the complaining do to me? Nothing. It just made me bitter. If you are complaining against God, complaining against your spouse, your husband, your wife, your children, your parents, members of your family during the time you are suffering, what will that gain you? Nothing but bitterness and anger. So I really want you to know when you are suffering, please don't start complaining. Whatever you do, don't complain against God. Don't complain against others. 
hold your peace. That's another perspective that you should have about suffering. The third perspective that you should have about suffering is that you are not the only one that is suffering in life. You are not the only one. There are people who are suffering more than you. It's so easy for us to concentrate on ourselves and think that other people are not suffering as we are suffering. The Bible says what you are going through, other people who have more faith than you, who are more loyal to God, who are more devoted to God, they are suffering even worse things in their life. So that's another perspective to have about suffering. When you have those three insights, those three ideas, those three views about the suffering that you are going through, then guess what? That knowledge of God will make you steadfast. You will remain firm in your faith. You will continue to do what is right in the sight of God. That is my experience. God will come through for each one of us in the right way at the right time. Remember what we have dealt with today in this broadcast as we finish. We have dealt with what can make us fail to wait patiently for God. The impatience of others can make us fail to wait patiently for God. The success of the unrighteous and the wicked can make us fail to wait patiently for God. Self-deception through pride, presumptuousness, and miscalculation can make us fail to wait patiently for God. Suffering and lack of knowledge of God's will in our suffering can make us fail to wait patiently for God. May God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit bless his word in our life. May God in his mercy hear us and answer us. Isaiah chapter 30 verse 18. Therefore the Lord will wait that he may be gracious to you. And therefore God will be exalted that he may have mercy on you. For the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are all those who wait for him. God will take care of those who wait for him. God will make them happy. That's where we finish. Thank you so much for watching this broadcast. Thank you for listening to this broadcast. Until another time on this same platform, I am your host, Pastor Dr. Kemi Atanda Hilori the General Overseer of Living Hope Church. Thank you so much. I love you, for God loves you much, much more. God bless you. Bye for now. Bye.